Okay, so topic of the talk is democratization, democratization, democratizing DevOps with policy as code. So first, I'm Anders. Uh, I work as a developer advocate at Styra, which is the uh, inventors of, of the open policy agent, which will be uh, covered in this talk. A, a background in software development, um, primarily in uh, identity systems, access control, and, and uh, all that jazz. So I've been kind of involved in the OPA community for the last two, two and a half years. Uh, when I'm not working with OPA, I'm, I'm, I enjoy cooking, food, and football. And you'll find me on Twitter, GitHub, so on. So the challenge or the problem we're trying to solve with OPA or with policy as code in general, uh, it's, it's really this. It's to manage policy in increasingly distributed, complex, and heterogeneous systems. So we have, of course, like the application stack. We have our deployment targets or deployment platforms. We have our cloud providers. We have data sources and databases. And uh, of course, all of these do policy in, in, in one form or other, uh, decides who can access your application, your databases, uh, who can deploy and uh, what certain times and so on. The problem is that they all do policy in their own way. So the goal of OPA, and I, I guess o policy as code to a larger extent, is really to unify policy and policy enforcement across this whole diverse stack. So the way we do it is by the open policy agent. But, uh, but for most things I'll be talking about here, kind of, it's going to be more generic for policy as code in, in general. But for OPA, it's an open source general purpose policy engine. It provides a unified tool set and a framework for working with policy across all these uh, diverse technologies. It decouples policy from application logic, and that's kind of a key concept in policy as code. Sort of like you'd move out uh, storage as a responsibility from your application. That's kind of the way we think about policy. So we move out policy to uh, an external component. And that's what we, why we call it decoupling. Uh, OPA doesn't do enforcement though. That's still up to your application. So OPA or these policy engines, they can tell you what or if something should be allowed or not, but it's still up to you to enforce that decision. And that's, and, and the matter in, in which you do that is still up to you. It could be like a 403 response, it could be maybe sending a message to a Slack channel or what have you. So for OPA, policies are written in a declarative language called Rego, which I'll give you a little crash course in in a, in a few minutes. And since it is a general purpose policy engine, uh, the use cases are, are vast. Like they're ranging from things like Kubernetes admission control, you have microservice authorization or app authorization, infrastructure policies for Terraform or Pulumi, data source filtering, and CICD pipeline policies. And so there's there's really no limit to, if, if, if you can think of policy, it's OPA is probably going to be a good fit. It's a vibrant open source community with uh, uh, a lot of individual and, and corporate contributors. And of course, it's, it's not just, uh, a hobbyist open source project, but it's uh, used by some of the biggest companies in the world. And if that's not enough to convince you, maybe this quote uh, does. I think it summarizes uh, OPA in, in a, to a large extent. Like, the open policy agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework that helps me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. So that, that pretty much pinpoints what, what OPA is about. So the title of the talk was Democratization of, of DevOps through policy as code. So, so how, how does that really work? Is it just like a buzzword I, I threw in here to, to uh, for, for, for some effect, like no, it's 
it's it's actually something I, I really believe in. And this is not uh, particularly connected to OPAD, but this could be for, for just uh, reasoning uh, about policy as code. So this kind of table for comparison, and this is just a few of, of the benefits I see as with for the policy as code model. So compared to the legacy model or the traditional model, where your policy, organizational policies are often stored in like Word documents, PDF files, or emails, or memos. With policy as code, policy is under Git, it's under version control. So you have a history of your policies and you can work with policy as you would with any other code. So we're talking about pull requests, code reviews, even linting, testing, and so on. So all the benefits of working with something as code applies here as well. As for visibility, of course, uh, if you're working with Git or any like version control, anyone could in your organization uh, with access, of course, can can review your policy and, and see like these are the policies that are enforced in our organization. While with the old model where your policy is stored in documents, PDFs and memos, uh, you first off, you, you need to know where to find these documents. And, uh, and then you need to ask someone for ac access. So, so it's a democratization in, in that regard as well. And what if, you, what if you find a bug in a policy or what if you need something to change? Like the old way of doing this is you'd ask your manager or you'd ask someone who would be responsible for that policy. The policy as code way of doing it is again with Git. So you'd submit a pull request and doesn't that automatically mean that it, it will be accepted, but that's where the discussion is gonna happen. So it's it's a natural flow for, for uh, the development team. And policy decisions in the old model, you kind of coded, you, you took that document or PDF or wherever you could find policy and then you'd write, and try to implement that in your code, if it was a job application or .NET or, or what have you. While in the policy as code model, the policy is kept outside of the application and the application queries uh, the policy engine for policy decisions. So there's no tight coupling uh, in your applications for policies and the policy can change without updating the application. And same goes for compliance tests. Uh, while they used to be manual, where you had to check, like, uh, are all these statements in, in my PDF file, are they actually implemented by my development teams? Uh, those are also automatic in the policy as code model. And audit logging uh, used to be something pretty complex. How do we know, like, where do we have violation of our policies? That used to be pretty hard when you have like eight programming languages and eight different logging frameworks. Well, with a policy as code model, you have one unified way of, of dealing with violations and dealing with audit logging. Okay, so that's kind of more uh, in, in general about uh, policy as code and, and I think the benefits. So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a short little deep dive into now is OPA and how we do that. So how do we deal with all these uh, diverse set of technologies? Uh, the, the policy decision model works something like this. So you have an incoming request for your service. The service in turn queries OPA to say, is this request allowed or not? Or is this deployment allowed or not? Or whatever uh, decision we, we might want to query for. And as part of the input, we provide JSON. And as part of the output, OPA provides JSON. So any, any system that can talk JSON or understand JSON and, and can send HTTP requests can uh, de facto integrate with OPA. OPA itself, it's a tiny little binary, so you can run it pretty much anywhere. It's a self-contained contained one, so no dependencies or anything like that. So ideally, you deploy it as close to your services as possible. So this 
normally means on the same host as a daemon or maybe as a sidecar container. And the way you communicate with OPA is through its REST API. But there are also uh, some uh, other options like writing a Go library, Envoy, Istio integrations, or even WebAssembly. As for policy offering, uh, again, OPA offers this language called Rego, which is a declarative high-level policy language. It's a policy consists of any number of rules. And if you think of it, that's pretty much what a policy is. It's, it, it is a number of rules. And a rule would common, commonly return a Boolean response, like true or false. You're not allowed or you are allowed. But again, you can return any uh, valid JSON object. So strings, lists, objects. Uh, Rego features uh, over 150, I think now, built-in functions like uh, JSON web token validation, date and time functions, uh, IP address ranges, and so on. It ships with a test framework. It's well documented. And there's a really nice playground, which I'll show you in uh, just a few seconds. But uh, of course, policy is one part of, of, of the problem or of the solution. But policy itself is rarely useful unless we have data. So if we say uh, you're, you're only allowed if, if you're an admin, we, we need to get that data from somewhere. Uh, what's your, what are your roles, for example? So the way we can provide that is through various mechanisms. We can either provide OPA with JSON web tokens. We can provide OPA with data as part of the query. So we say, I am Anders, and I have these roles. Am I allowed to access this endpoint? But we can also push or pull data into OPA synchronously. So if, if we want to have keep like larger data sets uh, online into OPA's memory, we can we can do that uh, as well. And finally, there is an HTTP send function so that you can query uh, external endpoints from inside of your policy if you need that kind of uh, if you need to query someone some endpoint at policy evaluation time. OK, so at this point, I'm going to give a quick little demo. And this is from the Rego Playground. And what you'll see here to, up to your right, this is uh, an incoming request. And of course, uh, how this is going to look is going to vary depending on your service and, and what, what that query is for. But what I try to simulate here is a kind of pretty standard like web service or a web application where you have an incoming request, you have a request method, you have a path, and you have a user. And you want to determine, should this request be allowed or not? So the way you do that in Rego is by adding a rule. And the kind of anatomy of a rule is something like this. You have a name of the rule. In this case, I'm going to call it allow. But uh, the name of the, these rules, they don't mean anything to OPA. They don't have a, there's no like special syntax or anything for that. So allow, it makes sense for us as humans. So hence why I'm going to go with that. So I'm going to say here, allow. And here's the name of the rule. And it's followed by the body of the rule. And the way it works if, is if all the conditions inside of the rule are true, then we say that the rule is true. So in this case, we might want to use some data from the input. So if we say input request, and we say method is get, or method is equal to get. And if we, and again, if all the conditions, so we can add more conditions here. If we say input request add path, and I'm just going to say the first component here, because if I'd say like if any get request to the user endpoint, uh, we, I'd like to allow that. So I'm just going to say if that's equal to users, uh, then and we now evaluate this rule, we're going to see that allow is true. Because in this request, the request method is get, and the first path component is user. So we're essentially saying in this rule that if anyone can read any user data. And yeah, that seems kind of fine. Uh, what is what happens if we change that? If we do something like put here, we evaluate that. We see that we get nothing back. So to uh, to fix that, we could say that by default, allow should be false. That's a pretty good default for any authorization system, I'd say. So now, if we do this, we'll we'll ensure that we always have a response back. In this case, it's either going to be true or it's going to be false. So what if we want to allow put requests 
but only when the user is equal to the user making the request. So you can edit your own user, but not uh, other users. We're going to add another allow rule. And that's how you do or. Like inside of these rules, the conditions are added together. So they all need to be true. And if we add more rules, they're or. So if one of them is true, the allow rule is said to be true. So in this case, we're going to see if input request method is equal to put. And the and this one is going to be the same. We still want to deal with the user's endpoint. But if the next, the next path component needs to be equal to the to this guy, to the user. So we're going to say user name. So if this component here is equal to the other uh, component in the path, it should be allowed. And now it's not, since we're trying to edit a uh, user chain here. If we change this to Anders, we'll see that allow is true. So now we have a policy that says that anyone can read any uh, users, but only the user making the request can uh, modify uh, their own user. So that was a, a very simple uh, example of using Rego to build a simple authorization policy. And this is uh, maybe overtly simplified, but I think it gives a pretty good idea on how, how we can work with policy as code and that it's fairly uh, readable and easy to work with, at least if you have some programming experience. OK, so, so where do you get started then? Or how do you get started? Uh, my suggestion is, if you're interested in, in these concepts, you start small. Maybe you write a few simple policies, maybe write a few unit tests. Uh, if you go with OPA, we have uh, some great documentation uh, where you can get a feel for the basics and uh, these built-in functions. And uh, once you once you do, then you can start consider uh, applications close to you. Uh, maybe apps you built previously, libraries you work with, and so on, and consider like where are the policies. Uh, currently residing, because you obviously have these policies somewhere already. And once you identify those, you can start to delegate some of those to OPA. And again, you can start small. You don't need to rewrite your whole application at a, at a single uh, point in time. But maybe you just take a single endpoint, uh, maybe take a single role, let the admin uh, check go through OPA. You deploy that, and you build experience from that. Uh, after that, you can start to scale up. Uh, OPA has a lot of like, like management components for, again, we talked about decision logging. You can go and fetch policies from remote endpoints through bundle servers and so on. The Styra Academy uh, is a free course on uh, OPA and Rego development. There's also uh, the Styra DAS, the declarative authorization service, which is like a management component, which is a, a free version you can try. And of course, uh, I'd love that you join the uh, OPA Slack community where you can ask questions as you go along and uh, as you learn. So with that, I say thank you. And uh, I'll, if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them to the best of my abilities. So thanks.